Hi, Year 13, it's Mr. Azapardi with another uh, video on Buddhism in the West. And today we're looking at Stephen Batchelor's Secular Buddhism. Uh, Stephen Batchelor is specifically mentioned on the specification, so you could get an essay asking about him. Um, and so we're going to look at his Secular Buddhism, and we're going to look at these uh, questions. Obviously, sorry, we, I should say we've already looked a bit at the Stephen Batchelor already, because we looked at him a little bit when we looked at the, less, the stuff on the Samsara in Year 12. So we looked at his views on rebirth. And in some ways, um, there's a lot of repetition between what we looked at before and what we're looking at here. Uh, but we'll, we'll see that as we go through. So what are the things we're going to look at? Uh, so we're going to look at obviously what he believes, but the sort of uh, analytical questions we're going to look at are, are there good reasons to accept back to the secular Buddhism? So are there good reasons to think it's a good way of looking at things? Is it authentically Buddhist? And does he successfully adapt Buddhism for the Western world? We will look at that more when we um, compare Bachelor with uh, someone called Paul Nitter. So the very last um, uh, person we're going to look at in Buddhism in the West is this guy, Paul Nitter. And Paul Nitter is a guy that, that kind of tries to create a... Um, try, tries to think say that people can be both Christian and Buddhist at the same time, kind of combine those belief systems. And so I suppose him and Bachelor are quite an interesting comparison because if you think about it, historically... In the Western world, the major religion has been Christianity. Um, but today, arguably, the major belief system is um, atheism or humanism or materialism. The belief, you know, there's no supernatural world at all. And the idea, I suppose, is what they're trying to say is which is the better adaptation for the Western world of Buddhism? One that combines it with um, Christianity or one that combines it with atheism and materialism? Okay, so we're going to look first at what who Bachelor is, what he believes, and then we're going to look at kind of um, looking at detail about his re taking. We're going to take apart some of his key beliefs, uh, things he says about Buddhism, and look at his reasons and how he can be criticised. So who's Stephen Bachelor? I will give you these slides so you don't need to make notes on this. He lived in. He's born in 1953. He's from. He's born in Scotland, but he lived mainly in, in the UK or he grew up in the UK. When he was 18, he travelled to India, uh, that would be 1971, so that was quite a common thing to do at that time as part of like the hippie movement, people travelling around the world, particularly going to India. He settled in the exiled Tibetan community in Dharamsala and became a Buddhist monk. Um, so we looked at the Dalai Lama before, and the Dalai Lama set up this community in a place called Dharamsala in India, um, where many Tibetan refugees live, who left after the Chinese invaded Tibet. And he settled in that community and he became a Buddhist monk there. He fully embraced Buddhist practice, but had some doubts about key teachings, especially karma and rebirth. I think we've watched in the past a video where he talks about uh, when he was a, a monk, it kind of, it was a big problem for him that he didn't believe in these things. In 1981, he became a monk in the Rinzai tradition in Japan. Uh, so he became a Rinzai Zen uh, monk. I think his reasons for doing that, when I've read about them, were that um, he felt that this was a tradition that that focused more on practice than on beliefs. So there was just a, a lot more focus on koans and all that kind of stuff. In 1985, he disrobed something. He stopped being a monk and he got married. Since this time, he's been a teacher of Buddhism and meditation as well as an author. He identifies as a secular Buddhist and is certainly the most famous Buddhist in this category. His famous books include Buddhism Without Beliefs, Confession of a Buddhist Atheist and After Buddhism. And Bachelor has said recently that he's moved from being a Buddhist agnostic, that means a person who says that they just don't know about questions about karma and rebirth, to being a more committed atheist or secular Buddhist, but who's saying like he basically just does not believe in rebirth or karma. So what does he believe? He's a materialist, he says. Um, that means that he believes that there's nothing beyond the material world, nothing, nothing supernatural. He does not accept, accept the reality of karma and rebirth, or at least he does not accept them in a literal way. He would probably be open to the psychological uh, and metaphorical interpretations of karma and rebirth. In fact, he definitely would be open to those interpretations that you find in, in a lot of Western Buddhists. But he doesn't believe in literally rebirth or literally the idea that your actions have some kind of supernatural effect on your future. He thinks a lot of... The metaphysical beliefs of Buddhism are just taken from the religious context in which the Buddha lived. We will explore this in more detail, but basically he means he thinks that the Buddha taught rebirth. Base, 
basically because that's just what everyone believed in around him so we just kind of accepted it and went with it rather than it being something that was like a, a real belief of his that's a controversial view he thinks that Buddhism can exist as a spiritual path without the teachings of karma and rebirth. So he, he thinks if you take karma and rebirth away, there's no real problem. He thinks nirvana, thinks of nirvana, or awakening as he calls it, as a way of being in the world, not as an absolute reality outside samsara. That, that should make you think of some things we've already talked about before. Uh, quite a lot of interesting stuff to say about that, but we'll come back to that. He thinks of Bu that Buddhism is a set of practices, not a belief system. So he thinks of Buddhism as something that you do, not a set of things that you believe. Now, there is quite a lot of precedent for that, and we'll think, we might look about that, that a little bit. But um, if you think about, you know, um, the, the, parable, the parable of the raft, um, the parable of the poisoned arrow, both of those kind of point towards the idea that Buddhism is for a practical purpose to get you to nirvana. And the power of the raft really suggests that, you know, believing in or holding on to a certain set of beliefs is not the most important thing in Buddhism. So there is some precedent for that. And he says that, that his idea of the essence of Buddhism can be boiled down to four Ps. The principle of conditionality, that means dependent origination, but he doesn't mean dependent origination over a series of lives. He just means dependent origination as it happens in this life. Principally, the idea that things have causes and to combat those, th to 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 remove the causes, to remove the thing. The process of uh, Four Noble Tasks, he put in truths in brackets, that's because he thinks of the Four Noble Truths as four things to do, you know, explore suffering, explore its cause, practice the Eightfold Path, realise divine, rather than as truths to believe in. The practice of mindful awareness, you know, that's what he's calling meditation, and the power of self-reliance, so the idea that you could re rely on yourself to, to bring yourself happiness. So though he thinks that Buddhism is about these things that are things you do, not a set, set of fixed beliefs you have to believe in. Okay, so um, I'm what we're going to do is you've got a worksheet that you should have, have in front of you. Either you can have it on the, on the computer or you can have it um, printed out. Easier if you have it printed out if you can, but you can fill it in the computer, it's fine. Um, and what we're going to do is I'm going to go through uh, a series of the things that Bachelor uh, believes, his claims that he makes. And then I'm going to go through on this slide the reasons he gives for thinking that, for thinking that, for how he justifies his view. And I want you to make notes using this PowerPoint on, um, on your worksheet under that bit, the reasons that Bachelor gives. Underneath that, you've got a place for criticisms. I'm going to give you some readings to help you find your criticisms to that. And then there's a, a thing where you put who is right, where you just have to say what you think, who you think is correct in, in this sense. All of the quotes I've taken, uh, I've um, used from Bachelor are from these two sources. These are relatively short articles that you can read yourself. Uh, Bachelor Rebirth, A Case for Buddhist Agnosticism, is uh, actually an article that we read last year when we were looking at samsara. So you have that article, you should have it in your folders. And then back to this article, A Secular Buddhist is an, available online. It's just where he gives an outline of what he means by being a secular Buddhist. So if you just type, if you want to read that whole article, just type in back to a secular Buddhist online, you'll get that article. Oops, everything's in a weird order. Uh, <clears throat> now, <clears throat> When you um, come to look at the criticisms, these are the two articles I'm going to give you. One is by a monk, a Theravada monk called Venerable Punyadamo. It's called Buddhism Without Beliefs Critique. That is actually a review or a criticism of Bachelor's book, Buddhism Without Beliefs. But I have basically taken it apart, that article, and just given you some quotes. I've divided it off into some quotes, which, which should make it more directly relevant to what we're looking at. The second one is by an author called B. Alan Wallace. It's called Distorted Visions of Buddhism, which is a criticism generally of um, another criticism of, of Bachelor. But again, I haven't given you the whole article. I've kind of picked out key quotes that you can use uh, to criticise. So, like I say, you can have your work in front of you. I'm going to go through the Bachelor stuff and then, and then you're going to go through the crit criticisms. And then what we're going to do in the lesson is you get, have some time to watch this video and do your criticisms and then we'll feed back on the criticisms after at the end of the lesson 
Okay, so the first point. Butler says the Buddha taught karma and rebirth, but they were not a unique element of his teaching or something he saw as important. So here's, the, here's some quotes from his two articles. He says, even though the Buddha accepted the idea of rebirth, one could argue that he simply reflected the ideologies of his time. Long before the Buddha, India had developed a cosmology, it's a way of looking at the universe, which included the ideas of karma, rebirth, and liberation. Now we know that is um, true to some extent. In other words, we know that the dominant religious system of the day was a Brahmanism, which believed in karma, rebirth, and uh, an idea of liberation from rebirth that is moksha uh, their equivalent of nirvana and we know that many of the samana groups as well at the time of the buddha believed in a similar set of teachings so his idea is that actually there's nothing that wasn't a really unique or important part of the buddha's teachings he just kind of took out just accepted what was there already in the culture so here's another quote i take such utterances he's talking here about times when the Buddha talked about rebirth and karma, to be determined by the common metaphysical outlook of that time rather than reflecting an intrinsic component of the Dharma. So in other words, he's saying, look, it was when he says determined, he means completely decided. That word means that they were completely decided. So he is saying his assumption is that the um, when the Buddha talked about rebirth, what he said was completely uh, just taken from what everybody around him believed and that it wasn't actually a very important part of when he says intrinsic component of the Dhamma it wasn't actually a very important part of the Buddha's own teachings it was just kind of he just you know wasn't really very interested in what happened after, about you know uh, what happened after you die and all that kind of stuff so he just accepted what everyone else believed that's what that's what Bachelor says now you can use parts of quote the, those quotes or you can just explain in your in your um, in your work he, what he says like paraphrase his ideas so that's what he says he's just taking over the ideas of people before him okay number two the, the, there's a lot of this is there's a bit of stuff here that might be, might seem repetitious but that's because I'm trying to kind of dig into the different things he says about karma and rebirth so secondly it is not essential for people following the Buddhist path to accept the teaching of rebirth so what does he say about that? So he says, there are instances in his discourses, the Kalama Sutta, for example, where he says, he's talking about the Buddha, that the practice of Dharma is meaningful whether or not you believe in a hereafter or not. So he said, he, he's first of all saying, well, why, why, why do I believe this? Well, because the Buddha believed it. The Buddha said, uh, the practice of the Dharma is meaningful whether or not you believe in a hereafter. So in other words, you don't need to believe in rebirth to follow the Buddha's path. He also says this, when you bracket off those beliefs, in other words, karma and rebirth, you are not left with a fragmentary and emasculated teaching, but with an entirely adequate ethical, philosophical and practical framework for living your life in this world. And I think some parts of this quote are important, quite important to use. So here I would include parts of this quote. So in, you're not left, and emasculated just means kind of reduced to nothing or like something that, that's lost its essence, you know, its power. So he's basically saying, look, you're not left with, if you take out rebirth, you're not left with a teaching that's kind of nothing if you're lost its power. You're left with a really, a, a, a set of teachings that are still provide a good framework for ethical life, for living in the world. So yeah, you don't need karma and rebirth. Just to come back to that, so this is linked onto that other, the first point he makes, what the Buddha said, so in the Kalama Sutta said, the disciple of the Noble Ones, Kalamas, who has such a hate-free mind, such a malice-free mind, such an undefiled mind, and such a purified mind, is one by whom four solaces are found here and now. So what the Buddha is saying here is that someone who follows the Buddhist path and in doing so has developed a mind free of hate, free of malice is just another word for hate, really, a pure, and it's someone who's developed their mind through meditation in the Buddhist way can find four solaces. That's four things that can bring you comfort. I'm only going to look at the first two because they're the relevant ones here. He says, suppose there is a hereafter and there is a fruit result of deeds done well and ill. That means suppose there is karma and rebirth. Then it is possible that at the dissolution of the body after death, I shall rise, arise into the heavenly world, which is possessed of the state of bliss. This is the first solace found by him. So the first comfort you can get is if there is a karma and rebirth, when I die, I'll probably go to the God realm. Then he says, suppose there is no hereafter and there is no fruit, fruit, no result of deeds done well or ill. Yet in this world, here and now, free from hatred, free from malice, safe and sound and happy, I, I keep myself. This is the second solace found by him. So then he says, 
But suppose there is no karma and rebirth. Well, still, if you've done the things that the Buddha said, if you follow the Buddha's teachings, you will find yourself safe and sound and happy. So in other words, Buddhism leads to a happy life, even if there's no rebirth. So it does seem that there's some justification uh, that Bachelor has for, for thinking that the Buddha thought that his teachings didn't, the, the use of his teachings did not depend on whether rebirth is true. Okay, number three, Buddhism is a set of practices, not a belief system. This means Buddhists do not have to accept the teachings of karma and rebirth. So here's what he says, his quote, Above all, secular Buddhism is, not some, is something to do, not something to believe in. This pragmatism is evident in many of the classic parables, the poisoned arrows, the city, the raft. Now, what I would put down here is um, the stuff about the parables. You know, the Buddha seemed to have, say something like this, that actually his his teaching was something to be put into practice not a set of beliefs that you you have to just cling on to the beliefs it's just something to put into practice so there's some justification there i don't know what the parable of the the city is i'm sorry about that um uh but whether it's the um the phantom city the Mount mahayana parable i do not know but i think he's talking about something in the pali canon so but we can put down just a poison down on a raft just the idea that buddhism is about getting away from suffering in a practical way not really about metaphysical speculation about the world or about clinging on to a set of beliefs. Then you can look at this stuff from the Kalama Sutta. Well, what's relevant from this quote? I'm not going to read it all the way through. But this is where the Buddha says, don't accept things just on tradition or just because they're in scripture. Put them into practice and see if they work and then accept them. So in the Kalama Sutta, you can say, well, the Buddha, this is his, the Buddha emphasized that we should accept things that practically work. We shouldn't just accept things because they're in scripture. So we don't have to believe in karma and rebirth. That's the idea there. Okay, this is a more complicated one. Awakening, which he means nirvana, is not a mystical insight into an absolute reality. Rather, it is a way of living in the world without one's actions being determined by greed, hatred and ignorance. Here's his quote. Enlightenment, therefore, though I prefer the term awakening, is not a mystical insight into the true nature of mind or reality, but always weirdly it accords with the established views of one's brands of Buddhism, but rather the opening up of a way of being in this world that is no longer determined by one's greed, hatred, fear and selfishness. Now, um, he doesn't give a great deal of justification for why he believes this, but it, it's an important part of his beliefs that Nirvana, when you get to, because because the idea that there is this thing called Nirvana, a kind of absolute reality outside of samsara, is, is there's a problem from a from a secular Buddhist belief point of view because it's kind of like well you there's no proof that it exists or how can we believe in it if it, if we can't see it and all that kind of stuff. If you're a materialist, it's hard to believe in a thing outside of the material world, which is this absolute reality, which you get in contact with or you you you're yeah, you get in touch with or you have an insight into when you get to nirvana. So what he's saying is nirvana, effectively saying that nirvana is a state of mind. Nirvana is a way of being in the world without greed, hatred and ignorance. It's not, there's nothing more, more supernatural to it than that. Now, interestingly, there are precedents in the Buddhist tradition for agreeing with that, particularly Nagarjuna. Nagarjuna, when he's teaching of emptiness, when he, he said there's no difference between samsara and nirvana, and what he meant by that was really that samsara and nirvana are equally empty of inherent existence. There's no inherent existence in either. And that essentially that means that um, when you get to nirvana, you haven't gone realize some ultimate reality that that's lacking in emptiness you've just realized the emptiness of everything in samsara so so nirvana is essentially just seeing emptiness it's not getting in touch with something uh, that's different to the everyday world now i'm going to talk a little bit about the evaluation here because you will find particularly in the writings of uh, punyadamo he is the person who's going to criticize this effectively by, by saying that the buddha the buddha did believe in an absolute reality um, uh, that there was, that Nirvana was this thing, this absolute reality. But, and this is where I'm going to come to my next slide. <coughs> this is a slide we've looked at before, and a, a slide that's kind of important if you want to get some higher level evaluation in. David R. Loy, in his book, A New Buddhist Path, he suggests that the earliest Buddhist texts, the Tripitaka, the Pali Canon, contain different ideas about the nature of Nirvana, kind of conflicting ideas. And this may reflect the fact that the scriptures were written over a long period of time by different authors. This is what we call multivocality. The two many is about Nirvana, 
<coughs> the, sorry, the two main ideas about Nirvana <coughs> that Loy thinks we can find in these texts are A, Nirvana is a transcendent reality, an eternal and unchanging realm which is outside of samsara. And B, Nirvana is a way of living in the world without any greed, hatred, or delusion. So this stuff I would put, David R. Loy, in your evaluation, who is right? Because if David R. Loy is correct, and I think it's a good, he's got good reasons to think that's true, um, then back, you could say that Bachelor's interpretation of Nirvana as just a way of living in the world is in the Pali Canon, but so is the idea of um, uh, of Nirvana as a, an, an a, rea a transcendent reality outside of samsara. So in other words, both both interpretations are there in the Pali Canon. That would mean that, that Bachelor is, is not a, if we're talking about is Bachelor a distortion of the original Buddha's teachings? No, it's not a distortion. It's simply a, um, uh, it's simply emphasizing one thing that you found found in the earliest teachings and not emphasizing others. Okay, our last one. There are no good reasons to believe in rebirth. So there's a few things to put down here. Um, so here's, here's some quotes. One of the most lasting and powerful realizations of the Enlightenment was that an atheistic materialist uh, could be just as moral as a believer, and maybe even more so. This is when he's talking about the Enlightenment here. This is him talking about the European Enlightenment, not you know the period, the, the time when people start to believe in uh, less in religion and more in science and so on. And not, he's not talking about the Buddha's enlightenment. Now, the, here's one of his criticisms of rebirth. We could remember this from last year. Uh, some people argue that you need to believe in an afterlife to have a good, uh, a firm basis for morality. If there was no afterlife, then people would feel that they didn't need to um, be a good person because there would be no punishment for their sins. But he says, we have seen that since the enlightenment, people who, without a religion, do not just simply give up all sense of morals and ethics, so we don't need to believe in rebirth for uh, to be a moral person. So that's one reason why uh, there's no good reason why he doesn't believe in rebirth. He doesn't think there's good reasons to believe in it. Another problem. Here's another quote. Another problem which has also beset traditional Buddhists is the question of what it is that is reborn. Religions that posit an eternal soul that is essentially distinct from the body mind complex escape this dilemma. The body may die, but the soul continues to exist. However, one of the central Buddhist doctrines, however, is that of non-self, anatman, or anatta as we call it. The denial of an intrinsic identity or soul or self that can either be found through analysis or mystically realized in meditation. So what is this talking about? Well, um, he's basically saying there are no good reasons to believe in rebirth because from a Buddhist point of view, rebirth actually conflicts with the teaching of anatta. There's no self, so what is it that gets reborn? He's saying basically that doesn't make any sense, therefore there's good reasons actually to not believe in rebirth. Buddhists shouldn't believe in rebirth because it conflicts with anatta. Okay, now this is quote is from, if we remember uh, back to um, uh, the case we looked at of that little kid who was reborn, who who, who was identified as the rebirth of a, of a Lama. His name was Lama Osul. He was seen as the le rebirth of Lama Yeshe. Now, in that article, he talked about how um, the... It was seen as proof of the rebirth, you know, amongst amongst the followers of Tibetan Buddhism who knew Lama Ozil, they would take it as proof that he was the rebirth of Lama Yeshe because he he could pick out the belongings that used to belong to Lama Yeshe. He could he would act in a certain way, and people would say it was like Lama Yeshe. He could he would claim he could remember things that Lama Yeshe did, and so on. Here's what Bachelor says. Let us imagine that the child is simply responding to the expectations of the adults around him. He already knows that when he makes certain gestures or speaks in a certain tone of voice, those who care for him will exclaim with joy, oh, that's just like Lama Yeshe. So when this sensitive child is confronted with a range of rosaries, could he not simply be responding to the hopes and expectations of his audience, none of whom are indifferent to the outcome? One wonders if the same tests were run under laboratory conditions in the presence of neutral observers whether the, result, the results would be the same. So we've talked about this before, right? He thinks that, he's basically saying, look, some people think that these, the fact that these small children can pick out the belongings that belong to people that died before they were born, me is proof that they are the reincarnations of these people but he is saying no this is not good proof because probably he's just picking up on the body language of those people when he gets near to picking up the wrong belongings 
they they've got negative body, body language when they he goes near to picking up the right belongings they look really positive about it so um that means that he is saying um, bah, 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 that yeah this is not good proof that rebirth is real okay i think that's everything no i was wrong so this just last slide Last slide is just to remind you, yes, once you've got your notes back, back to look, all you need to do is read those two articles, not a lot to read, and see if you can fill in criticisms for each of how might you criticise Bachelor, why might you think he's not justified in believing in, in what he believes, and uh, you might not be able to find criticisms for each one, for each, all five, but see what you can find, and then what we'll do is we'll have another meeting on the lesson, we'll feed back and we'll discuss this. Okay, thanks a lot.